Hey, Wadi, how are you? Good, how are you, Walter? Good. Thanks for making it. Absolutely, happy to be here. Sorry yeah. I can't be there in person. Yeah. Let me how ask you, you a quick question. Was your advisor at Berkeley David Gross? Is that right? No, it was actually Orlando Alvarez. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, so I, I worked with Orlando. He was my um, advisor while I was there. David was actually on sabbatical uh, the year, I, my last year in graduate school, and he came along with some problems that I got excited about. So we actually wrote a couple of papers my last year in graduate school. I see. Yeah, so, so I, was just, I was just looking you up on the archive. So I, I went I went back. I went yeah. far back and I saw the papers. Yeah, so those papers were written with David when he was on sabbatical in Berkeley my last year, but he was you know, he was he was at Princeton except for that year. And, yeah, and yeah. Orlando Alvarez was my advisor. We worked on some things about coadjoint orbits and conformal field theory that uh, vanished into the ether. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It might, it might gain some uh, relevance now in the conformal bootstrap era. Is that possible? Yeah, you, you can imagine. Yeah. I mean, it was uh, an effort to try to use this sort of mathematical approach of representation theory to reproduce, to reconstruct conformal field theory and string theory from the ground up. But Anyway, yeah, no, so I, I worked with David that year. Okay. How are things down there? Minutes. So you guys have this weekly uh, gathering? Yeah, it's a Monday colloquium. We're just trying to keep it going through the COVID era. Should we try to uh, set up your screen to make sure that we're... Uh, sure, I can do that. Do you? Do, are you able to share your screen or do I have to do that for you? No, you can do it. Oh, that's in the middle of the talk. How's that? Okay, looks good. I think. Okay, go oh, on square and share until we get started, or just leave it up. Um, you can just leave it up. Okay, great. It's fine. We'll wait a few minutes. Uh, mm. people to start joining in. Sure. Yeah, I was. I toyed with the idea of trying to do a poll in the middle, but then I discovered that the way my thing is set up, I can only do a poll if I'm running the meeting. Um. And I thought about trying to get you to do a poll, but it's just. Oh, I, oh, oh, it, oh, I see. I thought I think uh, it would waste a bunch of time, and it would be complicated. And I think I'll. Well, I mean, you could. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how to do it. I was just. Yeah, right. I think you, as the host, would have to send out a poll, and the people would answer it, and um, then you'd have to send me the results. I mean, we could. We you could ask people to raise their hands, and then that's some kind of. Uh, yeah, I might do. That. I, I think I'll probably just. Uh, I'll see how it goes when we get to that point in time. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'd also, this is uh, Keith Baker. I'd also like to thank you. You go by Wally, is that it? Wally with a T. Yeah, hi, Keith. Nice to meet uh, you. Thank, thank you for accepting uh, the offer to come and, and, and present. This is a, it's called a physics club, but it's actually a colloquium. Maybe Walter can explain why it's a club. I don't know. Well, I, I, what I heard is that, that that's what Gibbs called it, right? That's, okay. Yeah. It goes oh, really? Back to that, but maybe I so. like it. I mean, it's it, it gives it a more um, informal Collo colloquial feel. Than colloquial. <laughs> Yeah. No, that's what Hosea Willard Gibbs called it. Yeah. Oh, hey, hi, Mike. How it goes all the way back to the beginning. Ah. Nice. So it's always been the physics club since the beginning of the. Yeah. Yeah. 18 and something. Ah. Nice. How's it going, Mike? Going well. Good. Going well. But I got to admit, I enjoy these Monday get togethers. Oh. Yeah, it's really nice to have some mechanism for getting people in a department together on a regular basis in the current. Uh, yeah, all that's missing is the coffee. Yeah. <laughs> so Keith, what do you work on? I'm an experimentalist at the LHC in the Atlas collaboration. Oh, very good. Yeah, and um, my claim to fame is I helped to build the detectors used in the discovery channel and um, um, we also uh, used a boosted decision tree and were able to get greater sensitivity than the cut-based analysis alone even in the golden channel so that's my career man that, that's you know look. very good yeah these boosted decision trees I, my, my, I talk a bit to um, my colleague Mike Williams who you know uh -huh. works on LHCB and he's done a lot of using machine learning mechanisms and things to pull out it, it's amazing what in what you can do now with um, sophisticated mm -hmm. algorithms to extract, extract data. I agree, but you know what's even more amazing is that uh, sort of back in 2012, 2013, well, 2011 and 2012, 
my generation just frowned on machine learning algorithms used in analysis. These were black boxes and, and people didn't want. Now it's the rage. Everybody is, is pushing this, including the funding agencies. So, yeah. yeah. It's kind of remarkable how quickly that's changed. I mean, I, I, is, I, I agree. Know, frankly, I worked on, um, you know, AI before I went to grad school in physics decades oh. ago. And that was, was kind of a big boom, you know, back in like, the late 80s and then it kind of became clear it was a really hard problem and I I yeah. kind of feel like you know you can do a lot of great things with the current machine learning algorithms but it's unclear that you can do everything with them let me put it that way that is true no it, it still has some growing to do some ripening but yeah yeah I think you <laughs> apply to the right problems it, it, you can pull out amazing things but um so there's one more question I wanted to ask you before Walter shuts us up. You were at Stanford in the mid 80s. So, I was. Yeah, so was I. Did you ever go to the Varian Physics Building? Absolutely. So I was actually a math undergrad, but I, yeah. I hung yeah. out in physics a bit. Um, yeah, absolutely. I used to go to the math department too. Yeah. Very good. So you were in the physics department at that in those years? Yes, I was in the graduate program. Oh, very good. Yeah, I didn't get to know too many graduate students in physics. I actually only decided to move into physics towards the end of my undergraduate time. So All right. to pass All through. Right. I hung out in the uh, coffee house then a lot. All right. All right. You know, not too far from Varian. Yes. Uh-huh. Great. Yep. Great. Excellent. Hello. Yeah. Okay, Can maybe anybody we... hear me? I guess not. I can hear you. Yeah, we can Keith hear you. Baker. Could, you. could you please mute yourself? Keith <laughs> Baker. Could you please mute yes. yourself? My name is Ralph Siegel. We worked together at CBAF many years of ago. Of course. Yes, of course I remember you. You and me and uh, Ben Zeidman. And I'm That's right. And I'm now, I'm now living in a retirement place in New Jersey. My daughter lives in New Haven, and she put me on the Yale all right. physics list, so I thought I'd try and hear this uh, okay. colloquium. Fantastic. Give her a hug and thank, thank her for doing that. So. Uh, okay, very good. Yeah. It's great seeing you again, Ralph. Yeah. All right. Uh, that group has had very good longevity. Most of us are still around. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I heard Ben is too. He's moved. Uh, ben is still going, you know, he's not doing much research, but he, he's still going strong. Yeah. Well, I think we need to get started. Uh, okay, four, four. sorry uh, for the interruption. Yeah, no problem. So um, it's a pleasure for me to um, welcome uh, Professor Wadi Taylor uh, from MIT to uh, Physics Club today. Uh, Wadi, uh, got his PhD at Berkeley, uh, working with uh, Orlando Alvarez. And then he went on to do postdoctoral work at MIT, uh, followed by um, a faculty, junior faculty position at Princeton. And then he came back to MIT uh, also as a faculty uh, where he is now a, a, a full professor of physics. Um, Wadi's area of expertise is string theory. Um, he has made important contributions to both non-perturbative aspects of the subject, as well as um, compactifications and making contact with four dimensions and with the standard model of particle physics. But uh, string theory is not the subject of the talk today. Uh, in the last decade or so, um, Wadi has turned to what's perhaps a problem that's more challenging than even string theory. And that's uh, educating um, the next generation of um, leaders and scientists in how to think about energy policy from the point of view of a physicist. And um, in teaching this course in collaboration with Bob Jaffe, he wrote a really beautiful textbook about two years ago. I think it was two, about two years ago um titled uh, the physics of energy and uh, i think some of the things that he learned in the course of writing this really beautiful book uh, will be the subject of the talk today so i will shut up now and uh cede the floor to wadi well, thanks a lot walter and thanks to all of you for having me down there uh, i'm sorry i can't be there in person i was actually born in new haven 
Uh, both my parents did uh, graduate work at did undergrad. My dad was an undergraduate and also graduate work at Yale. So I was born there, and uh, it's always nice to be back. But I'll just have to be content with a virtual visit. So um, yeah, it's nice to see people there getting together. I want to start with a quick anecdote uh, that sort of illuminates, I think, the way we think about energy. One of my colleagues uh, once told me a story about how his son had put together a bunch of yellow Legos into a kind of a funny shaped blob and presented them to my colleague, his father, and said, Dad, look at that. And the father said, well, what is it? And he said, it's a chicken. And my colleague said, oh, a chicken, bok, 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 bok. And the, the son said, no, silly, not the animal chicken, the food chicken. And he had obviously missed the point that the word chicken not only applies to these two different things, but that those things are actually the same thing. And I think sometimes with energy, we run into the same thing with, with students and even some, to some extent ourselves when we, you know, we teach a student in a class about how energy is a conserved quantity and they work with a pendulum or a bunch of pulleys and they think about potential energy and kinetic energy. And then they go out in their car and they drive a few miles to target and they use some gas and don't really think about how to connect those two concepts of energy. And I think for, for many of us, um, those two things are more disparate than perhaps they should be. And I think part of the message of my colloquium is that part of our job perhaps um, as physics educators and as, as scientists is to try to bring together our scientific understanding of energy with the understanding of energy that we need for human systems um, in order for our students to understand that, in order for politicians and journalists and people who are influential in making energy policy and decisions about how we use energy uh, really need to understand both the science and the uh, actual uses of energy. So anyway, that's the um, framing of things. I'm gonna start with um, just a brief, you know, sort of bringing together those two different ways of thinking about energy. I mean, of course, in physics, when we teach about the physics of mechanics or ENM or quantum mechanics, energy is the central concept, right? You teach about mechanics and you have a harmonic oscillator. Can you all see my uh, pointer there? You know, the energy sloshes back and forth as the oscillator moves back and forth between potential energy and kinetic energy. Um, if you look at an electromagnetic system, you have you know, your famous LRC circuit. Following the flow of energy in virtually any physical system is really one of the key ways to learn about what's happening in that system and really to understand it. You know, in the LRC circuit, the energy sloshes back and forth between the capacitor and the inductor. It is then um, thermalized through, through the resistor and is lost, dissipated in heat energy. Um, Understanding that flow of energy really tells you what you need to know about this one equation here, which is the rate of change of energy is minus I squared R is really key to understanding the system. And then, of course, when we get to quantum mechanics, we appreciate, if we didn't already in the context of Hamiltonian mechanics, that energy really plays a even more fundamental role in, in basic physics in the sense that the Hamiltonian of the system is really the thing that determines the time evolution of the system. So it's really a very fundamental and central concept in physics. Understanding a system, a physical system, basically involves following the energy flow. And this is just as true of the Earth considered as a, as a total system as it is of any of these more elementary systems that we discuss in our courses. Um, this is a, a picture from the Energy Exascale Earth System, which is a, um, an Earth simulation model, a high resolution Earth model uh, developed at, at, uh, at LLNL, uh, which can be used to study climate and extreme temperatures, sea level rise, and things like that. It's an open source system, so anybody can take it and play with it. And basically, it's a physics system in which you can follow the energy flow. So, you know, energy in science is fundamental. In physics, it's fundamental to understanding systems. At the same time, energy and the science and technology associated with energy have really been the drivers of modern civilization, going back all the way to the first use of fire, which is basically releasing chemical energy stored in materials to give us warmth and, and heat for cooking, 
going forward to the agricultural revolution where you know, food energy is in some sense, one of the most fundamental uses that we make of energy. You need energy, calories, which is contained in food to keep your body going and, and to keep, enable you to do all the things that we do. So the technologies that enabled us to grow food are really energy technologies. You know, moving forward, the steam engine powered the industrial revolution, manufacturing and transport. And going further forward, the development of the ability to transmit, transmit through electrical power lines, energy over large distances, you know, automobiles with their use of energy and an internal combustion engine enabled huge advances in our society. And now we're, you know, if you think about it, mo all of these different things that I've depicted here are basically ways of indirectly using energy that originally came from the sun was captured in the case of crops, for example, uh, recently by um, growing organisms. And in the case of um, oil or coal was captured millions of years ago and stored and then is now being released. We're now moving towards an era in which we can more directly capture the sun's energy. And so this sequence of energy sciences and science and technologies has really driven our modern, our modern world. Um, so, you know, again, part of what I want to do is, is talk about bringing together those two points of view. And of course, the other aspect of this is that our use of energy, the way in which we've used energy and the, re the resources we use to produce our energy and the byproducts of the, the use of those sources has led to really a central challenge of the current century. Um, as I'm sure everyone here has some appreciation of, uh, our use of fossil fuels is releasing CO2, and we'll go through this in a bit more detail, uh, which leads to rising temperatures, rising sea levels, increased extreme weather events, um, ocean acidification. And so these are all issues that afflict us because of the way in which we're using energy. So motivated by some of these considerations, about 12 years ago, as, as um, Walter mentioned, Bob Jaffe and I started teaching a course to MIT undergraduates on the physics of energy. And the goals of this course were in some sense twofold. Um, on the one hand, we wanted to introduce students who had really just a freshman physics background, which everyone at MIT takes freshman physics. So this really meant we were teaching to people in all the different uh, majors across the Institute. Um, we wanted to introduce them to the basic scientific principles of energy systems, including energy sources, energy conversions, storage uses, and side effects like radiation and climate change. So that was, a, in some sense, a primary goal. And I think both Bob and I were motivated by what I think you muted me as well, but I'm, uh, can everybody hear me? Great. Um, so we were motivated as, as well by ourselves wanting to understand energy systems better and understand, I, I, I wanted to understand better really what was going on with climate um, and how our energy use impacted it and see what we might be able to, whether there were avenues in which we might be able to contribute in some sense to um, what's going on there. But a secondary goal, which I think developed as we taught the course, is that it turns out that energy is a very powerful theme to use to introduce and then unify pretty much all of modern physics. Uh, and I'll say more about this later. That if you follow energy, it really leads you through the core of a lot of interesting modern physics, including you know, solid state physics and uh, quantum mechanics, nuclear physics, you know, hydropower and, and uh, wind energy tying into, into hydrodynamics many different you know, atmospheric physics, all these different kinds of physics come together and energy as a concept really allows you to, in a streamlined way, bring together a lot of the ideas that underlie our modern understanding of physics. So as Walter mentioned, uh, two years ago in 2018, we published our a textbook that evolved out of the course notes. And, you know, I wanna emphasize that neither Bob or I, as, as um, Walter said, you know, I coming from string theory, quantum gravity, my research has not been related to practical energy systems. Um, but I, I think that energy is really an important topic. And so all of us, you know, I'm, I'm continuing to do research on high energy physics and I'm, I'm not solely devoting myself to doing energy, but I believe that all of us to some level, to some extent, are, have a certain responsibility to understand these important issues of the time and we should understand them well enough that we can communicate to people and we should include them in relevant ways in the physics curriculum. 
Um, so this is really the primary message of the colloquium, which I'll articulate in various ways through the talk and, and repeat at the end, is that physical science lies at the core of real world energy systems and problems. We should understand those systems. And most of the physics needed, I would say, is fairly simple. By fairly simple, I mean most of the physics underlying energy systems should be understandable by anyone who has followed an undergraduate curriculum of physics. Uh, you know, I sometimes give colloquia and talks on quantum gravity, string theory, you know, 11 dimensional, 12 dimensional space times and, and very complicated things. I go to fascinating talks about topological insulators and black holes and, and those are difficult systems to understand, but the physics of energy systems at its core is really not um, something that should be beyond the reach of anyone who studies undergraduate physics. Uh, and so, you know, the last part of this, I think we should really educate our students and others, journalists, politicians, et cetera, about energy science. Um, I, I think that really solving the world's energy and climate issues at this point is primarily a political, economic, and social challenge. But in order to make the right decisions, you have to be informed by sound science. And I do think that we as physicists are in a very good position to understand, explain, and educate people about that science. Okay, so that was my, my sort of prologue preamble to kind of get everybody warmed up. Um, what I'm gonna do in, the, in this talk is I'll spend a little while talking about energy and climate. I wanna kind of go through what we understand about energy and climate. Many of you really know quite a bit of this story, some more than others. I think it's useful to articulate clearly what part of the energy and climate story is absolutely bedrock, clear cut science that no one who really understands what's going on could argue about and which parts are at the limits of our understanding with, with our current um, understanding of how things work and where there are questions that we don't know the answers to. Um, then I'll talk a bit about uh, energy systems, energy sources, energy uses, conversions, and how physics uh, plays a role in that, both to kind of talk about those systems because they're interesting in their own right, and also to illustrate how these tie in to the basic themes of our energy courses, uh, I'm sorry, of our physics courses in, in a physics department. And I'll, at the end, sort of close the loop by coming back to energy and physics curriculum. Um, and please, if you have a question, please uh, feel free to, to ask questions. I'm, I'm happy to field questions on the fly, um, as well as, of course, at the end. All right. So let me walk through a little bit the uh, story of energy and climate. Um, again, just trying to be clear cut about what, what we know and what, what is happening. So in the last 50 years, since about 1970, the rate at which we use energy, and we'll talk more later about what that means in the context of the statement that energy is conserved and the second law of thermodynamics. We've used energy in the sense of degrading high quality energy like petroleum. Um, at a rate which has tripled in the last 50 years. If you go back, it's, it's useful to deconstruct this. Uh, the per capita energy use in the last 50 years, so 1970 is about here, uh, sorry, uh, 1970 is about here. Uh, the per capita energy use has gone up by roughly 50% in the last 50 years. The population has roughly doubled. And if you multiply 1.5 by two, you get three. So the total world energy use has gone up by a factor of roughly three in the last 50 years. Our current rate of energy consumption is about 18 terawatts. And if you break that up in the US on a per capita basis, it's about a gigajoule a day. Globally, the average is about one fifth of that, 0.2 gigajoules a day. So in the US, we use energy at about five times the rate of your average person around the world. To get a handle on that, it's kind of uh, one, one thing I find useful is to relate that to the amount of energy you consume in the food you eat in a day. If you eat a roughly 2,400, 2,500 kilocalorie diet, typical American diet, uh, that food energy represents about 10 megajoules in a day. So the fact that we use a gigajoules worth of energy, roughly speaking, means that every US person has effectively 100 servants working for them in the form of their washing machine and their heating system and their car, doing work for them at a rate that it would take about 100 people working constantly using all their food energy to contribute to that, that energy usage. Uh, yes, Ralph, I see you have a question. 
Yes, if I understand those curves correctly, the world energy use has gone up by about a factor of 10. Depends on when you start. So when I say 50 years, the 1970 is sort of over here on the curve. Oh, okay. From All right. But so back in 1970, it was maybe 170. Okay, years. starting from 1970. Yeah, okay. Right. So there's, I'll mention that the data here where it's, where it's heavily dotted, the, th the thick data, that's better data. The, the, okay. Before that, it's a bit of an extrapolation with a bit more of an estimate. So yes, you're right. If you go back to 1900, over the last 120 years, it's gone up by about a factor of 10. But if you go back, it looks like about three. A, a factor of three since 1970, factor of 10 since 1900. Yep. Thank you. Absolutely. So where do we get this energy? So roughly 85% of that energy comes from fossil fuels. And unfortunately, I've been quoting that number now for about a decade. Um, even 10 years ago, it was about 85% from fossil fuels. Here's, uh, this is from last year, in fact, the 2020 um, Statistical Review of World Energy by BP. It's a very good resource for learning about the numbers here. You can see that renewables have been growing substantially. In fact, on the right-hand side, you see that the fraction in, in non-hydro renewables has gone up substantially from a negligible amount to about 5% um, over the last 15 years or so, or sorry, the last 25 years or so. Um, unfortunately, the use of everything else has also been going up. So the fraction that is coming from non-fossil fuels is only a little over 15%. This year, I think, last in 2019, it went to 84 point change uh, percent. And you can see a few trends here on the right hand side. You can see that the use of oil as a fraction is decreasing, even though on the left hand side, you see that the total oil use is still going up. You see that natural gas is going up, which is, of course, a less carbon intensive resource than, than oil. Um, and you can see that renewables are growing essentially exponentially, but it's going to be quite some time still, even at that exponential rate of growth, uh, before they can really dominate. Okay. And so let's talk a little bit about fossil fuels. You know, why is it that 85% of our energy use is fossil fuels and that that has been slow to change, even though we see reasons why that's problematic? Well, basically fossil fuels are extremely abundant and they're a very compact source of energy. You know, you can put enough gas in the gas tank of your car to drive for hundreds of miles and it's not a very big gas tank, very compact. There are also very abundant resources. If you took all the existing fossil fuel resources, actually we have enough fossil fuel resources for about 200 years at the current rate of use. There's not enough petroleum, there's enough petroleum for maybe 50 years at current use rates, but if you allow for conversions, just without worrying about the environmental consequences or the consequences in other ways, you could take oil shale and tar sands. There are interconversions that allow you to convert different fossil fuels to liquid or solid fuels, and we could go for a couple hundred years. Economically, there's a huge infrastructure built up. It, people have really refined the systems and streamlined the systems for extracting, transforming, and then delivering and using fossil fuels for a variety of different energy systems. And so that's hard to compete with with a new technology. It takes many years, decades, to develop new technologies to the point where they have that level of streamlining. So that's one of the, one of the challenges. Now, you know, obviously there are pollution issues with uh, fossil fuels, car exhaust, there's mercury from coal mine, mercury from coal plants, mine tailings and things. One could, I think, have a reasonable argument about whether those pollution issues can be managed with technology. You know, good emission standards on cars can lower car emissions. Good emission standards on coal plants can reduce emissions there of the pollutants, things like mercury, NOx, and things like that. But the biggest issue is, of course, greenhouse gases, carbon monoxide and methane, which I, I wouldn't exactly qualify as pollutants. I mean, carbon dioxide is an important component of the atmosphere, and originally the Earth's atmosphere was primarily carbon dioxide. We'll talk more about the role of carbon dioxide, um, but it's definitely a problem. And the problem is because those carbon dioxide emissions affect the climate. And that's the story I want to kind of walk through a little bit is, is what is the impact of that 85% of our energy coming from fossil fuels? Uh, how, what is the impact of that on the planet? So now let's talk a little bit about climate. And there we get to talk about, you know, some nice physics that allows us to understand climate in a very clear way. Um, 
So by climate, let's just take the mean Earth surf temperature, Earth, Earth surf surface temperature as a proxy. Climate can mean a lot of different aspects of the of the climate, uh, but the mean temperature is a good simple number we can keep track of. And roughly speaking, the surface temperature of the Earth is regulated by a nice simple piece of physics, which is radiative balance. The power in is equal to the power out when you're in radiative equilibrium. So we can look at the way in which the sun's radiation is impingent on the Earth. And we see that the incoming power is the insulation, which is at the top of the Earth's atmosphere, about 1366 watts per meter squared. We multiply it by pi r squared, which is the cross-sectional area of the Earth, the effective area that gathers up that sunlight. And we have about 173,000 terawatts is the power, the rate at which energy hits Earth. And I'll just note that that is 10 to the fourth times larger than the rate at which we are using energy. And we'll come back to that ratio later. This is a huge amount of energy. So roughly 16% of that is reflected by Earth's surface. The surface albedo is about 0.16. And we can develop a very simple physics model based on just that information in which we can make an estimate of Earth's surface temperature. Let's for the moment assume that we have no uh, atmosphere or only, only oxygen and nitrogen, which do not uh, absorb the incoming or outgoing radiation. We'll assume that Earth has a homogeneous temperature and that Earth radiates as a black body with perfect emission and has that albedo of 8.0.16. Then, the Stefan Boltzmann law, which we teach in our various courses, statistical mechanics, thermodynamics, says that the rate at which Earth radiates energy is sigma t to the fourth times the surface area. The power in we just computed is one minus the albedo times I solar times the area divided by four, the ratio of the cross-sectional area to the total surface area. And we just use our knowledge of the, Stefan, uh, the, the Boltzmann constant, Stefan Boltzmann constant sigma, and we can do a calculation of T from this equation, and we get about minus six degrees Celsius. So this very simple model tells us that in radiative equilibrium, the solar energy coming to Earth will be balanced when the Earth radiates energy as a black body at minus six degrees Celsius. So that's a little bit off. The actual surface temperature is 20 degrees Celsius higher. And the biggest gap, the biggest lacuna in our calculation is not including the atmosphere and the so-called greenhouse effect. So the reason it's not minus six degrees Celsius on average, which would be a very cold winter coming up, is because water primarily, but also CO2 in the atmosphere, absorb and re-radiate outgoing thermal radiation. So the thermal radiation leaves the earth. It is absorbed in large part by clouds, the atmosphere, the water in the atmosphere, and then it is re-radiated both upwards and downwards. So we can modify our model to have a, a simple next order model where we imagine a very simple single layer atmosphere, just a one dimensional problem, really a zero dimensional problem. And we assume that the atmosphere absorbs all the outgoing infrared radiation. Uh, we now give the total albedo as 0 0.3, which is the actual measured albedo when you include the atmosphere, because the atmosphere reflects some of the incoming radiation. We redo the calculation, and now we get a surface temperature of about 30 degrees Celsius. So we're a little closer, but it's still an inaccurate calculation. And we could refine this. We could take account for the fact that the atmosphere doesn't actually absorb all frequencies of outgoing radiation, but only some. We can build in the fact that the atmosphere is stratified and has different amounts of water vapor and CO2 at different levels, build a one-dimensional atmosphere model, we could get a more accurate result, and we could continue with a full three-dimensional simulation. But this captures most of the essential physics and gets us pretty close already to the effect. Um, here's a picture which contains the actual radiative balance numbers as measured, <clears throat> you know, as I say, Part of what's wrong with this zero dimensional model on the left is that some frequencies just pass right through the clouds on the way out. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, the single layer approximation is imperfect. So again, the actual temperature is about 14 degrees. Okay, so that's the current situation on Earth. Now, as we burn fossil fuels, we release carbon dioxide. And this is the famous Keeling curve measured on a mountaintop in Hawaii, they measure the uh, CO2 levels. And you can see every year it's been gradually going up 
superimposed over the rising trajectory is this oscillation every year. The amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, every time we have a northern spring, it goes down as all the plants and the boreal forests in the northern hemisphere suck CO2 out of the atmosphere for their growth cycle. And then the CO2 in the atmosphere goes back up again at the end of the year right now when all the plants lose their leaves, things start to decay and all that CO2 is re-emitted. So that, that's the oscillation that overlies this annual cycle that overlies the rising. And there's, of course, more, more plant life in the Northern Hemisphere, which is why there is a cycle like that. OK, so this curve, however, you see is rising. Pre-industrial levels of CO2 were about 280 parts per million, and we're now about up to 410 parts per million. So how does the presence of increased CO2 in the atmosphere affect the radiative balance equation we just talked about? So again, this is very well understood physics. There's no questions here for anyone who understands you know, basics of chemistry, radiation, absorption. The CO2 absorption spectrum is very well understood. You can download it yourself from the HITRAN database. Just go online and you get a bunch of numbers and you can, you can do your own plot and confirm that this is the measure. You, know, you can even go out and do your own experiments if you're an experimentalist, which I'm not. But at least the data is out there for everyone to pull down. And you can do a very simple calculation. You can take the current atmospheric configuration, even in a one-dimensional model, you can get a pretty good estimate. And based on the current atmospheric configuration, you can make an estimation that if you double the amount of CO2, it will change the absorption. It will increase the amount of absorption because you'll have more CO2. Based on the known absorption coefficient of CO2, that will create an effect called radiative force, which is equivalent to a downward flux of more incoming solar radiation of about 3.7 watts per meter squared. So that's just a calculation based on existing data that scientists agree upon. If we have 3.7 watts per meter squared of additional incoming radiative flux, then there's a direct effect, which is the so-called uniform temperature response, where the Earth needs to heat up a little bit to re-reach to re radiative balance. So to reach radiative balance, you can easily calculate that to get the sigma, delta, sigma t to the fourth term to match that incoming 3.7 watts per meter squared, you need an additional 1.2 degrees Celsius of surface temperature. So the basic story is that if you just took our atmosphere as, as it exists, you double the CO2 in the atmosphere from 280 to 560, which we're not at yet, but we're heading towards quickly, um, then the uniform temperature response, the initial response, in, just in order to balance that incoming flux, is 1.2 degrees Celsius. This basic effect, although not the details of, of uh, the absorption spectrum at the level we understand it now, has been understood for about 100 years since Svante Arrhenius made comments about the fact that CO2 in the atmosphere could warm the planet. There's absolutely no question. The Keeling curve that is clearly measured on the left shows that CO2 is going up. And just like putting a blanket over you when you go to bed at night, when it gets cold in the, in the fall, you know that putting the blanket over you is going to keep you warmer. We know that putting CO2 in the atmosphere is going to increase Earth's temperature. That's all absolutely bedrock science. Then the question is, how much warming will actually happen? And this is where the cal calculations get much more complicated and the answers are less clear and there is uncertainty in our best calculations. So let's walk through that a little bit. And really here, we need to start to talk about feedbacks and here the devil is in the details. You really need to dig into more detailed analyses of various aspects of the climate system in order to be able to get a good estimate of what's going on. So everything I set up to this point, we can do a back of the envelope calculation and get pretty close. We can do a more careful calculation without having to worry about the entire planetary system, just looking at the current atmospheric configuration and get the number I gave you so far. To get further, we need to work harder. So feedbacks, an example of a feedback is the ice albedo feedback. As the temperature gets warmer, ice, particularly in the polar regions, but let's say particularly in the Arctic where it's most affected, begins to melt. It'll happen faster in the Arctic because we don't have an underlying continent. As the ice melts, regions that were previously covered by ice for more of the year become just open ocean. That has a lower albedo, and you get more absorption of incoming radiation, which is associated with more forcing. So that's a positive feedback loop. 
Climate is a very complicated nonlinear system with lots of these feedback loops. We can do a simple linear feedback analysis where incoming forcing causes a change in temperature. That causes a corresponding additional forcing due to a feedback parameterized by lambda times the initial change in temperature. And we end up with a geometric series. And when we sum the series, we get a change in temperature, which looks like minus one over lambda naught plus lambda, where lambda naught is the Planck feedback parameter, which is essentially the thing we already talked about that gives us 1.2 degrees change for 3.7 watts per meter squared of forcing. That gets added to our feedback parameter and we get some overall change in temperature. Now, this is again a linearized analysis, but notice that if lambda is bigger than 3.2 watts per meter squared degree Celsius, then this number in the denominator goes to zero and we get a runaway feedback effect. So even this simple linear analysis, we can get a runaway feedback if the feedbacks are too big. So again, it's a very complicated thing to figure these things all out. So we resort to numerical simulations and this is a very active and highly developed field of simulating the earth systems uh, using so-called general circulation models. And so I'm, I'm quoting here a figure from, uh, actually both from the um, I, IPCC, uh, the most recent report, uh, 2014, and the one before that, which was I think 2007, um, IPCC four and five. These are the best estimates based on an average of 20 general circulation models of how these feedback estimates work. Now I should emphasize climate models are not perfect. They differ. They can also agree for incorrect reasons. Some of them may use some of the same pieces of code. There are some things they get wrong. They are not apparently as good as we would like them to be at modeling ocean transport of thermal energy to the poles. They have a hard time reproducing in paleoclimate situations the exact temperature difference between the poles and the equator. And we don't know very well how to incorporate clouds, but many aspects of these are well understood and are a fairly good representation of our current scientific understanding of how climate works and can reproduce various aspects of paleoclimate very accurately. So let's just look at what we've got here. Um, this is a graph of the expected feedbacks from various different sources. So if you look over on the left, uh, water vapor, this one here is the biggest of the individual feedbacks. That's basically the fact that as the planet gets warmer, you get more water vapor in the atmosphere. As I already mentioned, water vapor is a greenhouse gas and therefore that will warm the planet further. There's a competing effect called the lapse rate effect, which has to do with the rate at which the temperature rise, drops as you go up and the lapse rate decreases as the temperature warms due to the increased moisture. And then what happens is that you get radiation at higher temperatures at higher elevations that actually can act as a negative feedback. Um, so you'll see that way, uh, water vapor plus lapse rate is estimated as a combined estimate here in these models. Sorry. Um, clouds, the one with the most variation here, as I say, are the most poorly understood. There's the albedo feedback. So there is uncertainty here. And now we need to start bringing in uncertainty into the story. But the upshot is that the estimate for the total feedback parameter is about 1.6 watts per meter squared. And if you plug that in to get the change in temperature, if you double the amount of carbon dioxide, the best estimates from the IPCC and other groups are that the change in temperature with a doubling of CO2 is expected to be about 3.2 degrees Celsius with an uncertainty of about 1.3 degrees. So that's a lot bigger than the 1.2 that we com computed when we didn't include feedbacks. The expectation is that feedbacks are quite substantial and will lead to about three degrees of Celsius of change with a big uncertainty. And this is where how scientists communicate this to policymakers, to journalists, to the public is a really important thing because it is people have a hard time evaluating risk and uncertainty. And Part of our job is to not only tell them what the expectation is, but also what the uncertainty is. And, and you know, just like when you're, wearing, when you're driving a car, you wear a seatbelt because you might crash. It's always good to keep into account the possibility that things could be significantly worse than your mean estimate. Um, so with those things in mind, we really want to um, think about these numbers carefully. Okay, so now let's talk about the, the actual impact. So let's look at the data on temperature. 
Here's an estimated average global surface temperature anomalies relative to 1961 to 1990 from various sources. Um, you see that basically the temperature has gone up about a half a degree from 1900 to 1950, and then another 0.5 to 0.8 degrees since about 1970. Um, there's some controversy about this, but these are really very solid numbers over this 150 years. There are big local variations, and the biggest effect of the warming, as I mentioned, has been at northern latitudes. To put this in context, it's useful to think about how this looks on a longer time scale. Here's the last 2,000 years data on temperature. And you see that over that time, the temp average temperature has gone up and down. So you have to use different proxies. As we go to longer time scales, you have to use things like ice core data, isotope information in the ice cores. The more recent data can be evaluated more accurately based on actual records, going back a little further based on tree rings and things. But we scientists think that this is a pretty accurate reproduction of the temperature profile over the last 2,000 years. The temperatures we are reaching now exceed the last 2,000 years. And in fact, uh, it is, we believe that it is likely that they're higher than they have been for millions of years. We'll talk a little bit more about the million year time frame later. Um, but how do we attribute these changes? The change between 1900 and 1950, in large part, I believe, and, and people who study this more than I do believe, can be attributed to recovery from the Little Ice Age. Driven, the Little Ice Age was driven by a combination of changes in solar cycles with less solar energy coming out, which can be mapped through sunspots and uh, vul volcanism. And those effects, solar activity and volcanism, can drive changes in the Earth's temperature by on the order of a half a degree over these periods, longer periods of time. But the change in the last 70 years, since about 1950, seems to be almost completely attributable to human activity, and in particular to CO2 and other greenhouse gases coming from humans. So it looks like anthropogenic effects are responsible at this point for about a half a degree to a, a full degree of, of temperature rise. And if we take the feedback parameter that I was describing a few minutes ago, if we take current CO2 levels at 410 parts per million, the IPCC estimates are that that should lead to about 1.6 degree of rising. And the reason we haven't seen that yet is because the full time that it takes for that 410 parts per million that we already have in the atmosphere to impact the Earth system is already on the order of 100 or 200 years. So even if we stopped emitting additional CO2 now and just kept the constant level of 410 degrees, the planet would continue to warm for another 100 to 200 years as it comes back to a new equilibrium. OK, so that's a sort of summary of the, of the situation. Um, pause for a minute. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different um, tone for a few minutes and, and just talk about some statements that people make about energy and climate and temperatures. And uh, I was thinking of trying to do this as a poll, but I think I, I couldn't get the technology the way I've got it set up on Zoom uh, working. And I think it would spend more time. So I, I'm just going to suggest I'm going to go through three statements made by famous physicists. And I want you to think about whether you whether you think each one is correct. And you can keep your own tally for how good your understanding is of these issues. First question. Freeman Dyson and many other people have made the statement that radiative forcing grows logarithmically with CO2 levels. And just think, do you think that that's a correct statement or not? Okay, I'm not going to worry about a poll, but just you have your own answer in mind. Okay. The correct answer is that this is a true statement. And it's an interesting statement. It means it, if we double CO2, the forcing will go up to 3.7 watts per meter squared. In order to get 7.4 watts per meter squared, we would have to double it again. And in fact, this logarithmic dependence is implicit in our notation of F2x. That's the forcing that we get if we double um, CO2 levels. And we can understand the physics of this from the forms of the so-called wings on the CO2 absorption band. The vertical axis here is logarithmic. So this is really an exponentially growing uh, absorption coefficient. So if we change the temperature slightly, we move out, sorry, if we change the amount of CO2 slightly, we move out slightly the boundary between the region of CO2, of, 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 of 
these are, this is a wavelength of photons in the horizontal axis. We change slightly the boundary between those photons that are completely absorbed and those that are not absorbed. And because it's an exponential curve, the change in temperature or the change in forcing will be the constant change from a two times forcing times the log base two of the ratio of CO2s. And you can read that either way. Um, you could say, well, that means that maybe it's not so bad because it means that it's, it doesn't get exponentially worse. On the other hand, you can think of it as this really means that we need to be careful starting right now because the CO2 we're emitting right now is worse than the CO2 we'll be emitting once we get further along on this trajectory. It's, I think, an interesting fact that you don't uh, see a lot of discussion of, but it, it helps understand how things work. Okay, Stephen Hawking at one point made the statement that human action in terms of emitting carbon dioxide in the coming years could push the earth over the, over the brink to become like Venus with a temperature of 250 degrees. Just think to yourself, do you think that's a correct statement? I mentioned this feedback parameter. If lambda is bigger than minus lambda naught, then uh, you're in, or bigger than lambda naught, you're in trouble. You know, you know what you think the answer is? Okay, this is actually false. Even though anthropogenic climate change and warming are going to cause a lot of problems, this doomsday scenario is really not uh, possible given our current understanding. And there's two simple reasons I can give that make that clear. One is the logarithmic effect of the CO2 uh, makes it very hard to imagine any way in which our changes in the CO2 level could cause this level of a feedback. A more compelling statement perhaps is that if we look at paleoclimate data, it is true that right now temperatures are reaching a levels that they are higher that are higher than anything we've seen in a million years. But if we go back 60 million years, 55 million years ago, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere was five to 10 times higher. Since then, it's been removed by what are called tectonic scale effects. India crashing into Eurasia, raising mountains which have chemically weathered has removed much of that CO2 out of the atmosphere. And so these things that have happened over tens of millions of years have lowered the CO2 levels. 55 million years ago, at these high CO2 levels, temperatures were five to 10 degrees higher, sea levels were hundreds of feet higher, and life flourished. Mammals actually evolved in this, in around this, at around this point in time, around the ESC. It's unlikely that human impacts are gonna push us back that far. Um, that's not, however, a, a reason to think that this is not a problem. It just means that we're not gonna push it to be like Venus. Many other very bad things will happen, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Finally, one more. Uh, will Happer at one point made a statement that CO2 is actually a benefit to the Earth. So again, think for yourself about whether you think that that is a correct statement. So this is a little nuanced. This is actually true in some senses, but not in the context of the current situation. It is in fact true that as we release CO2, it enhances plant growth. If you look at what happens to the 10 gigatons of carbon that we emit every year, two and a half of those 10 gigatons are absorbed in terrestrial biomass. So actually there's more plant growth going on in the presence of enhanced CO2. And there are areas that will become arable that have not been arable as the climate warms. Areas in Northern Canada where wildlife is moving in, there are things like that happening. And so I would say, if instead of increasing CO2 levels over 20 years or 50 years or 100 years, if we could very gradually increase CO2 levels over a million years and judiciously do it in such a way as to smooth out the glaciation cycles, one could argue that that might be a net positive for both ecosystems and humans because ecosystems would have a time to evolve to match over a million years uh, those changes. But that's totally the wrong time scale. The anthropic warming that's happening is happening in the matter of the next 200 years. This CO2 pulse that we're sending out will be reabsorbed in the ocean through ocean turnover in thousands of years. So the actual impacts in the short term are that ecosystems, which are already very pressed, will not be able to adapt. There will be increased extinction. Millions or perhaps billions of people will be displaced and affected by sea level rise. And there are a lot of unknowns in the system. I mean, if you look at, at paleoclimate data from the recent, relatively recent um, glaciation cycles, in the interglacial times, as the planet warms, CO2 actually goes up, but it's not the CO2 that's driving the warming. The warming in the interglacial cycles is driven by the Milankovitch cycles, which are 
cycles of the Earth's tilt and obliquity and, and various orbital parameters that drive the period, have driven the periodic ice ages over the last 600,000 years now that we have relatively little CO2 in the atmosphere compared to millions of years ago. Um, but the CO2 has actually been released when it gets warmer. So we don't really understand at what point the ocean sink, which captures an additional 2.5 gigatons a year, may stop or reverse. So you can ask, so how bad will it actually get? There are a lot of uncertainties. It's of course hard to predict because it depends on human activity. But without a major change of direction um, and the way in which we're doing things, it's gonna be very hard to avoid at least a two degree Celsius change. I already mentioned that with 410 parts per million, if we just stopped here, IPCC prediction gives us about 1.6 degrees of change. So it's going to be very hard to get stay below two, which is the current goal as stated, for instance, by the Paris Climate Accord. Let me just talk about a couple of, I'm running a little short on time, so I'll give you a sort of short drift. Uh, you know, there's a nice physics story about sea level rise. Part of the sea level rise, what we've seen at least so far, at least half comes from thermal expansion. And this is another very simple bit of physics. If you take the um, expansion coefficient of water, alpha V, multiply it by uh, the volume and the delta temperature, you get that the mixed layer of the ocean, which is the top 200 meters, if you raise the temperature by one degree Celsius, gives a shift of about 4.25 centimeters. And if you look since 1900, it's ocean levels have gone up by 20 to 25 centimeters. Of course, more will come from the deep ocean and from ice melt. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about ice melt in a minute. Um, I'm going to sort of skip through. This is a beautiful picture of my colleague, uh, Carrie Emanuel in the Earth Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences has a nice way of understanding hurricanes as basically Carnot engines. Just like the Carnot engines that you talk about in a basic thermodynamics class, you can look at what happens to the working fluid, the, the moisture, moisture in the atmosphere, uh, going through the cycle of a hurricane as a Carnot engine and relate the energy to the temperature. And you can see clearly that the greater the temperature is, the, the stronger the hurricanes become. Um, there's a lot of uncertainties that go beyond the simple things that we've been talking about. Ice melt is one of the biggest. Of course, uh, ice melt in the polar regions is changing the albedo. Ice melt in Greenland and Antarctica could cause dramatic sea level rise. And people do not understand the um, mechanics of ice in the ice sheets at the temperatures and pressures that are reached there well enough to really estimate well, but there could be from a half to two meters of additional sea rise based on ice sheets. Um, you know, weather intensity is increasing. Um, in some sense, what I think is one of the biggest problems from these changes is they're happening so fast and there are so many species already under threat of extinction. Um, the changes in the Earth's climate will put additional pressures on so many species that the estimate is that there may be a huge loss of biodiversity and you know, the UN put out a report last spring uh, showing that 25 to on the order of 25% of species are at risk of extinction in the coming decades um, from a combination of effects, other effects like human use of land, uh, human resource use, um, direct use of, of uh, different parts of the ecosystem, but also climate change will exacerbate all of those problems. Okay, so that was the story of the basics of climate and where we are right now. Um, I was going to say a little bit more about some energy physics systems and then I'll get back to the education. Um, Walter, I think I started a couple minutes late. What time should I aim at stopping at? Uh, so we started probably around 4.05, so you know, maybe another, I don't know, 12 minutes or so. Perfect. I'll aim at 5.05. So I'll, I'll go quickly through a few things and say a little bit more about others. So the next thing I was going to talk about is energy systems and how physics, this really ties in more to the, you know, the basic physics we teach in various ways and, and also thinking about, you know, how we can solve this problem. Um, so one question you want, might want to ask is where can we get the energy? And as a physicist, one nice way of organizing the various resources is by their total power, their, their, their scale, and by the power per square meter, their power density. And so we've organized here the different resources, which they're kind of color coded as to what the initial source is. There's really three different kinds of energy that we have access to. There is energy that comes from solar energy, 
And then you can see that flows into ocean thermal energy, biomass, wind, hydro, et cetera. There's geothermal flow, which really comes from nuclear decay and, and residual energy in the, in, in the core of the earth. And then there's tidal energy, which is a mechanical energy that is dissipated through tidal and tidal current energy. Um, things on the right are very dense, very high power per square meter and very economically desirable. Things towards the top are the ones that may actually be useful in replacing fossil fuels because we need many terawatts to replace fossil fuels. So solar obviously is at the top, ocean thermal, wind and biomass are nearby. Solar energy, I mentioned before, one, one one hundredth of one percent of the incident solar energy could provide all of human energy use. If we just took existing solar thermal and photovoltaic technology and deployed it on one to two percent of global desert areas, it's easy to do the calculation. Deserts are about four percent of the Earth's surface area. We could get four terawatts. That would provide all current electric power and land transport needs if we had electric cars using using that electricity. So. We could get, and, and you know, we could then use uh, solar energy for heating, and there would be a few aspects like air transport that would need to be dealt with with things like biofuels. But just this change, using existing technology on a small fraction of desert areas, would give us all of the electric power and land transport energy we need. The challenges to this are largely political, economic, and social. You can say, okay, technologically, how do you transmit it? Transmission is not a big problem. You can go 2,000 kilometers with about a 7% loss. Storage is the biggest problem. With solar thermal energy, where you basically use solar energy to heat a working fluid like an oil or water and then use that to run a heat engine, um, you can actually store that thermal energy for orders of days. It's much harder to get seasonal uh, storage. And that's one of the biggest outstanding challenges. Let me just talk a little bit about the challenge of storage. A typical plant might produce a gigawatt. A gigawatt energy for a day is 9 times 10 to the 13 joules. It is very hard to store that much energy. And it's hard for fundamental physics reasons. It's not like uh, microprocessors. You know, Moore's law says that the speed of processors and the scale of processors doubles every you know, year for some number of years. That's not going to happen with storage technologies, because each of the storage technologies you could imagine using has a fundamental constraint. Mechanics, good old MGH is our energy of pumped hydropower. If you want to store this amount of energy, 9 times 10 to the 13 joules, by pumping water up 300 meters, that's a pretty high um, level to pump it up, you need 3 times 10 to the 7th cubic meters of water. It's a lot of water. This is actually the primary storage mechanism used. Um, there's a, a hydropower storage system in Bath in England, which stores about nine gigawatt hours. And when it's commercial break time on the British television, everybody goes to make tea and turns on their electric teapots. And literally there's a three gigawatt surge and they use the pumped hydropower to provide that three gigawatts during those commercial breaks in British television. Um, this is right now the, the only real large scale grid connected storage mechanism in use. Uh, you could try to do it with capacitors. The energy density is limited by the breakdown voltage. Even if you go to supercapacitors, which have 100 megajoules per cubic meter, you still need something like a million cubic meters of capacitors to store just this one power plant's daily output. You can talk about batteries. Lithium ion batteries store about one megajoule per kilogram. Even if you go to hydrogen, which is the most dense chemical energy storage system we know of, which is 140 megajoules per kilogram, storing this amount of energy would require 900,000 car batteries, each of which was storing 100 megajoules. That's like 100 kilograms car batteries, 900,000 of them, or 600,000 kilograms of hydrogen. So there are some viable scenarios, but they all require really large scale systems. And this is not a problem that we're going to just engineer our way out of by factors of 10. Um, so I'm going to, that's, that's one of the biggest challenges out there. Um, going back to that picture with all the different energy sources, the thing that was next below solar is ocean thermal. So let's just talk briefly about that. Why can't we just take all the energy out of the oceans? If you look at the mixed layer that I mentioned, there's about 1100 zeta joules of energy. Um, if you look at the, the absorption rate, we just take the, um, basically the, the 15 percent of the world's surface that's nearest the equator. Uh, look at the, the oceans in that region, 200 watts per meter squared. Um, 
and, and look at the, uh, the area there with a 0.15 absorption rate, sorry, it's 0.15 absorption rate. Um, there's about 4,000 terawatts of energy absorbed in, tholo, in solar energy at, near the equator. And all that energy flows towards the poles as thermal energy being transported in the uh, large, large, uh, west, sir, large currents at the western edges of the, the, the boundary currents at the western edge of the northern uh, ocean basins. Um, and both north and southward currents give about two petawatts or 2,000 terawatts in each direction of energy. We could try to get that energy. The problem is the difference in temperature between the thermal energy at the top and say the cold water at the bottom is about 20, 22 to 27 degrees Celsius. And the Carnot efficiency of extracting that energy is very low. An ideal system would be about 7%, real systems are one or 2%, very low exergy, which we'll mention in a minute. Um, very hard to get that energy out. Okay, there are lots of, I, I'm running short on time and I wanna say a little bit more at the end about um, the, the context of um, our, our physics departments. Just briefly, I'll, I'll mention a few other nice stories that are interesting to bring in that are related to energy and basic physics. Of course, the second law of thermodynamics, there's a nice way in which we can understand entropy in terms of information, ent information entropy um, and understand from that perspective on entropy, uh, the distinction between high quality energy, which has very little entropy and low quality energy with lots of entropy. It explains why power plants and car engines lose so much energy. There's this idea of exergy, which is the amount of usable work that can be provided when it's brought into equilibrium with an environment. For some reason, physicists don't use this very much, but it's a very useful concept that helps us understand useful energy. And of course, the second law has ramifications all through energy physics. Um, other possible energy sources, there is a beautiful story of tidal energy, earth kinetic energy lost, rotational kinetic energy lost to the moon. Bottom line is, the total amount of energy is about is only a few terawatts, and we could only extract a teeny portion of that. So it's not a viable replacement. Wind power is a fascinating story. There are estimates from one to 100 terawatts of recoverable energy. 100 terawatt estimates, I think, make the error that they don't keep track of the fact that the atmosphere has a finite height. So you can't just lay layer after layer of wind farm for thousands of kilometers without using up that, that thing. It's not really a 2D resource. One terawatt is probably too small. We are probably going to be pushing the several terawatt range in the coming decade, and it'll be interesting to see how far that can go. Um, it's a very high quality and economically viable energy source, and it will certainly play a useful role in producing part of that four terawatts of electric energy that I mentioned. Um, you might ask, why not just take out the carbon? And there's another nice story about the entropy of mixing. When you mix carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, there's randomness associated with that. And so it takes energy to reduce that randomness. Simple calculation shows that if you wanted to store 37 gigatons of CO2, what we release in a given year, it would take 27 exajoules of energy, which is more than 40% of our electricity produ production, just as a bottom level energy needed to perform that unmixing that uh, would be needed in storage. Of course, it's better if you capture it before it's burnt like a carbon capture plant. Okay, I have two minutes left. There's other limits from physics. Betts limit, Shockley Quiet are all fascinating stories. In my last two minutes, let me just return to energy in the physics curriculum. What should be the role of physics and physics departments about energy? So at a basic level, we're not going to find really fundamental new sources of energy, no matter how hard we try, at least it seems unlikely to me. We're, you know, we know where most of the energy is, and it's unlikely we'll find a way around the second law or other fundamental constraints. There are huge opportunities for applied physics research, understanding better materials for photovoltaics, nuclear power, understanding storage technologies. These are all very important areas of research. Um, but I, I wanna again emphasize that I think a really important role that we in our physics departments can play is in teaching energy science to students from all disciplines. First of all, it's important that they understand some of the science that I've been going over today. And second of all, I think it's a way of really bringing people into physics. It makes physics obviously relevant. We get students in our energy course who at the end of the semester say, wow, I had no idea physics played such a central role in all these really important systems. I need to learn more physics. So we get students taking more physics classes because they realize, gosh, this is really central. Um, so I, I think 
adding an energy focus, uh, it's, you know, adding a course on energy, I think, is a great way of bringing in students and getting them interested in understanding some of these things. At the same time, adding energy related problems in your physics class on mechanics or EM or quantum engages the students with contemporary issues, makes them want to learn more about physics. It clarifies the relevance of some very abstract stuff. You're talking about entropy. When you can bring it down to why your car engine isn't more efficient, it really makes it concrete. As I said earlier, it really helps to use energy as a thread to unify the field of physics. And it also, I haven't emphasized this much, but when I say physics here, I really mean physical science. And I mean connecting to what's traditionally thought of as earth atmospheric and planetary science to chemistry, to biology. Energy is really an interdisciplinary subject. And one of the things that I've enjoyed about learning about this is the way in which it connects to other aspects of, of fundamental science. Um, so I'd encourage everyone to consider incorporating some of this into your material. And I'll just reprise the, the basic messages are that physical science lies at the core of real world systems. We should understand them. It's not that complicated. We should educate others. And people who understand how the science works are those who are in the best position to make sensible decisions and determine the directions that we uh, and our country and our planet go in in the coming decades. Um, and I'll just end with this. I'm not here to sell books, but uh, the publishers have agreed that if you use this discount, uh, you can get a 20% discount. If you use that code, you can get a 20% off on the textbook, which has a lot more detail of a lot of this. And um, it's only $80 at the uh, Cambridge University Press website. But um, I'll stop there and I will be happy to take any further questions. Okay, thank you, Wadi, for that very illuminating talk. And I'm sure there's lots of questions, but to try to keep it orderly, I'll ask you to raise your hand on Zoom if you have a question. And uh, I'll call on you. And I see that uh, Steve Gervin has a question. So why don't you uh, go ahead? Thank you. Uh, hi, Wadi. Um, so I was very surprised to hear you say that if, if we view the the recent input of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as a step function that it would take one or 200 years for the temperature to equilibrate. What, what is the source of that time scale? Uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, melting of large ice masses like in Antarctica. There's a really interesting calculation you can do, which is if you take a fraction of the incoming radiation, of the increase in incoming radiation and see how quickly it melts ice, how long it will, that's one of the exercises we put out in the book, how long will it take for Antarctica to melt? It would take thousands of years for all of the ice in Antarctica to melt. It won't take that long for the polar ice cap to melt, but, but it is a slow process to change, like Greenland, for instance, um, is melting quickly, but it's gonna be a very long process over the order of hundreds of years. The other aspect of that is that um, as, the, as the top of the ocean heats up, the conveyor belt that brings the warm water up to the polar regions, that water then becomes, um, it, it's, it becomes colder and it sinks and it goes down, it loses, it loses saltiness. So it, it, there's this thermohaline circulation that brings it into the lower ocean. So there's a, a longer time scale on which a lot of these parts of the system will equil equilibrate. Uh, I, I think the main thing is ice melt. Okay, I didn't realize you were talking about the time scale for the feedbacks. Okay, that makes sense. Oh yeah, sorry. I, I, I was I was talking about the actual real world time scale. That if we stop right now, uh, um, put if we you know if we stopped right now, actually the the terrestrial and ocean sinks would continue to absorb about five gigatons a year. So if we just stopped cold turkey, right? If we just stopped burning fossil fuels, CO two levels would actually drop reasonably rapidly for a number of years. Um, if we kept emitting at just the level that would keep us at 410, the time it would take for all those feedbacks to kick in and, and the equilibration with all those is, I believe, on the, I mean, nobody knows the numbers very well, but climate simulations would suggest on the order of 100 years. Thanks. Yep. Any other questions for uh, Wadi? Uh, yeah, you, hey, please go ahead. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm very curious about the role of water vapor uh, when we try to model these long-term evolutions. Because so far, it seems like we're just considering carbon dioxide 
Good. So the, I didn't get into detail about these general circulation models. Actually, let me go back a little bit because water vapor is, of course, a huge part of the story. And actually, um, water vapor is the biggest, water vapor and clouds um, is the biggest effect of these feedbacks. So let, let's look again at these feedbacks here that, that are estimated by, you know, the, the, um, the climate models that they're looking at include you know, water vapor content in a three-dimensional model. They include some, some uh, parameterized cloud models and things like that. The biggest effect, the biggest feedback effect is water vapor here. Um, the, the point is that the, the CO2 is the driver. You put some CO2 in the atmosphere and let's look at that feedback parameter. That feedback parameter is almost two, right? So that says that you, you put in a little bit of CO2 the immediate effect is that that will warm the planet 1.2 degrees and that 1.2 degree warming then produces another two you, you, you produces another two watts per meter squared of radiative forcing right so you had, let's say you had 3.7 watts per meter squared right you raise the temperature by 1.2 degrees as a result of that that will then produce another 1.5, 1.7 watts per meter squared of forcing, which produces this feedback. So water vapor is huge there. It's complicated by the lapse rate, which as I mentioned is the rate at which water vapor uh, changes, the, the, the saturation of water vapor changes as you go up in the atmosphere. And that changes the temperature, that the altitude at which the uh, captured radiation is then re-released. So the lapse rate is actually a negative feedback and those two combined give us a feedback parameter of about one. But this is extrapolated from the general circulation models that do a much more detailed simulation of clouds and water vapor in the atmosphere. So, you know, to do a really good atmospheric simulation, you need to keep track of water vapor. And it is in fact the primary drive, it is in fact the primary feedback, even though it's not the driver. In other words, you're starting from a point where we've already taken account of the water. Maybe, maybe, maybe this was your question. When we start in equilibrium at the current situation, um, the atmosphere, which in this model here, right, here's the current situation. The atmosphere here that's absorbing and re-radiating is primarily water vapor, right? This is not a calculation based on just CO2 as an absorber. This is saying in the current atmosphere with water vapor doing what it does, where water vapor is the primary greenhouse gas, these are the numbers for you know, 340 watts per meter squared is 1366 roughly divided by four. Uh, this is the 30% albedo is 100 going out. This is what comes down. This is, you know, the amount that's coming out in thermal radiation. Some of it passes right through. It's captured primarily by clouds and water vapor in the atmosphere, re-radiated up and down. Only a small part of that atmospheric effect is CO2. The question we then ask is what's the delta? If we add some CO2, how much does it change things by? So. The existing situation is primarily the, 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 the uh, warming that we have right now that gets us up to 14 degrees from minus six, that's primarily water vapor. The question we're asking is if we double the amount of CO2, how much does that change the forcing by? And then what's the, how does the system react to that? And they are also water vapor plays a key role. So water vapor is all over in this process. We're just focusing on CO2 as the driver because you know if, if we, put a lot of water vapor in the air, the system will rapidly reach equilibrium. It takes a very long time for CO2 to reach back, to be reabsorbed into the system. And it's worth mentioning here that, you know, methane, I haven't mentioned methane much. Methane is a powerful greenhouse gas, but its atmospheric lifetime is on the order of a decade. So if we stopped adding methane to the atmosphere, in 50 years, the effect of the methane would be gone. The carbon dioxide that we're putting in the atmosphere is going to hang around for long enough for this hundred year time scale of the melting and equilibration to affect to come in. Does that address your question? Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Yeah, I just thought water is something that seems more uh, manipulable uh, given our current technology. So we may not need to wait for carbon dioxide to do all the work um, if we're thinking about human intervention. Right. So I guess you could say, well, we could just suck water vapor out of the air. The problem is that, again, the time scale there is very short. So more would just evaporate. I mean, water vapor is going in and out of the oceans very quickly. You know, in the tropics, solar energy comes in, heats the ocean surface, and lots of water vapor goes up in the atmosphere. And, and you know, that's where all these hurricanes and things come from. So 
systematically sucking the water. I mean, there are a lot of ideas about geoengineering, although I, honestly, I'm not sure I've ever heard of anybody suggesting geoengineering by simply changing the water. Well, there are things where people talk about seeding clouds and, and changing, the, uh, changing the characteristics of the climate in ways that involve water vapor. So I guess that's, that's, that's the thing that people talk about. Um, the problem with these geoengineering things is you have to keep them going. I mean, if you've got that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and it keeps going up, you have some complicated geoengineering thing to offset the forcing. I mean, for one thing, you get ocean acidification continuing to happen. Um, but then if, if anything happens and, you know, civilization breaks down or, you know, you have problems, you, if you don't keep that geoengineering going, the CO2 is there, the, the radio forcing will be, will be great and you will have a harder time managing it. Problem just gets year, worse from year to year as well. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? So I believe Kimmy Cushman has a question. Go ahead. Hi, yeah. Um, so uh, you mentioned that the we could solve all the problems of energy right now if we put enough solar panels on the deserts. Um, and you said that it's the part of the reason that it's not really that feasible is because uh, the energy you have to store the energy, but also transporting it. Um, did how does the how is the relationship of the the energy decrease over like how far you transport it because you said Good. yeah so actually, let me let me let me say a few more things about that um so first uh, i wouldn't quite say that we could solve all the world's energy problems by putting the pvs or solar so actually sol solar thermal technology is in some ways also a very promising technology because it does have that storage for several days i wouldn't quite say we could solve all the world's problems but i would say we can actually produce all the electric power and land transport energy within a matter of decades by doing that. Um, and, you know, we'd only take one to 2% of the desert area. To address your exact question, which is about transmission, I don't think transmission is a real obstacle in this, in the sense that if you put a transmission line over several thousand kilometers, you lose maybe 7%. So you need a little bit of extra power capacity. But, you know, you could generate electricity in California and we could use it here. And we would lose maybe 20% or something going, you know, five, 6,000 kilometers. But that, all we need is an extra tw uh, overcapacity of 20%. So instead of, you know, 2% of the desert area, we could use 2.4% of the desert area. Um, storage is also, I, I, mean, I wouldn't say we can just immediately do it. Storage is definitely a challenge, but I also wouldn't say it's not feasible because of storage. Actually, I would say, the obstacles really are political, economic, and social. And a lot of it is economic. Right now, solar energy is approaching parity with other forms of power plants. You know, it's, it's pretty competitive in some markets. And that's part of the reason that solar energy is increasing in its fraction. With some cost placed on carbon, and you know, this is where it gets political, I think that if we could put a fair price on carbon so that carbon emissions were either through cap and trade or through a carbon tax were taxed in an appropriate way. And that energy was at least in part put into, I mean, part of it would have to offset the costs to various, you know, end, end consumers. But if part of it were put into incentives as, as some of it currently is for solar power, actually, I think that would very rapidly change things so that the already growing exponential curve would continue to grow at a very high rate and really within a decade, there's no, I don't see a real obstacle to getting most of our electric power and land tra transport needs just from existing solar technology with small economic incentives. And, you know, part of it is you have to buck the social and political patterns which exist right now, which I was mentioning are big obstacles to changing technologies. I mean, the fossil fuel companies, the use of petroleum in cars, the, the internal combustion engine is a highly tuned thing and it's going to take decades for electric cars to be as finely tuned and for electric transmission and uh, generation mechanisms to be as finely tuned but it's already almost economically competitive so i mean you know i'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that we will hopefully soon have an administration that will be pushing on some of these directions but i really think that it's not there's no there's no uh showstopper here Storage is the biggest challenge, but I would say it's a challenge and not a showstopper. Again, you want to have a balance of technologies and you're going to need to have other, you know, it may be that for a while we're going to use solar plants with natural gas plants to pick up when the solar's 
not producing as much energy as we need. But if we could shift in, even in that direction, it would be a big, a big improvement. Does that help address your question? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's really hopeful and I'm excited to be a part of the transition. Yeah, I think uh, hopefully we can all be excited about that as it, as it hopefully happens. <laughs> Great, other questions? Ralph has his physical hand up. Yeah, you are unmuted, so I think you 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 can go. You can just ask. If I, uh, I noticed that nuclear, uh, the percentage of nuclear energy has has remained quite constant. But, uh, it's um, actually even been going it, down. So I, let me let me say a little bit about that. Um, I didn't talk a lot about. I want to ask you. I sorry. Go I ahead. I also want to ask you if if uh, fusion is a included in that, if the, if the fusion could ever become a significant part of our energy source. Great, so these are really good questions. And actually one of the thorniest questions that my colleague Bob Jaffe and I struggled with as we were teaching this course and writing the book is, is how to think about nuclear energy. And you know, one can give an entire colloquium on nuclear energy. I will just give a very quick few comments here. First of all, the nuclear fraction has actually been going down as you see on this curve. Some countries are actually moving away from nuclear power, even though there are much safer new nuclear technologies, things like the pebble bed, you know, latest generation nuclear technologies. Um, and I think that in my, this is a little bit of my personal take on this. And there, I have colleagues who I very much respect who disagree with me. I don't think that we should be looking to nuclear for a substantial part of this for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that it's just a very complicated technology and it produces waste that we still haven't managed to find a way of dealing with. You know, there's this discussion of a Yucca Mountain waste plant and it, it's still not there. And it, it's very difficult dealing with nuclear waste. I mentioned the fact that I would not actually label carbon dioxide as a pollutant because as we release carbon dioxide, more plants grow. It's not really inimical to life itself. It's a problem when you put a lot of it out in a hurry because it really changes a lot of things in a bad way and it messes systems up. But 65 million years ago, there was lots of CO2 in the atmosphere and life thrived. Nuclear radiation and nuclear waste, on the other hand, is pretty much inimical to most forms of life on the planet. It really damages things and makes it harder for things to reproduce effectively. It's very complicated. And honestly, I think that a broad use of nuclear technology to solve the climate problem would involve so many nuclear reactors in so many places that there would be a lot of bad actors, but either unintentionally or people who weren't on top of it enough. And there could be a lot of problems that I think might be worse than what you're solving with it. On top of that, the amount of, the amount of uranium is limited. And if you just use once through reactors with uranium, you couldn't get more than 20% of our energy for the next 50 years, and then you'd have to stop. So, to me, solar and other renewables are cleaner. They don't have all those problems. And, it, and the energy is there. It's not like the solar energy isn't there. Um, th there is an advantage of nuclear power plants, which is you can run them 24-7. Um, but I, 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 you can have a lot of discussions about this. Personally, I don't think it's necessarily too useful to think of it as a big part of the energy profile that we need in the next three decades to turn this whole thing around. If you look at that curve and you look at what countries are doing with nuclear, it just doesn't seem feasible to build up. It, it seems like it would be, I mean, I'm getting a little polemical here, but you know, we only have a certain amount of energy of, you know, human capital and resources to put into what we're going to do about this situation at the current time. And it seems to me that nuclear energy is not necessarily the best bet in the next decade or two for that. On fusion, Fusion would be fantastic, but it's just not, it's still 50 years away for really economical long-term turner. And you know, part of the problem is right now what we do is deuterium tritium fusion. And you know, getting a, a sustained reaction, where do you get all the tritium is one question. That's a hard problem. And there's, there's, a, there's a host of problems which we get into more detail in, in the book, which to me makes it seem like it's still the technology of the future and it's not the thing which is gonna get us out of our current climate related issues. You know, it may be that in 100, 200 years, we'll have a, a really good fusion based economy, but we've got so much. So, I mean, you know, in some sense, solar energy is fusion energy. That's where the solar energy comes from. Fusion is happening in the sun. We've got a whopping big 
fusion reactor just four light minutes away. It's giving us 10,000 times more energy than we need. Let's just use that fusion byproduct. Um, that's my reaction to your question. Okay. So Anybody who's going in nuclear can feel free to chime in and, and tell me why I'm wrong. So the last question goes to uh, Stan Glasnick. Okay. Well, hi, thank you. Uh, I, I have a qualitative question concerning the issue of how we should be thinking about the fossil fuels. Uh, whether we should think about energy stored in oil or other fossil fuels, or we should rather think about uh, carbon and oxygen separated from each other, like uh, atoms are separated from each other, and then we obtain energy by them coming back together and going lower as a bound state in energy and emitting light or whatever kind of uh, emission of energy is involved in. And if, if, if the second picture is more uh, accurate, then we would say talking to students that the light from sun is separating objects that have a tendency to release energy when they combine back. And in that case, the energy is not stored in the individual objects, but in the separation of them to a distance where they cannot recombine. Good. So I like the way you frame the question. I'm sorry, you, you wanted to say more? No, I just wonder, I don't really know how complex processes in photosynthesis and other situations where such separation occurs go on and what happens so that CO2 is produced from the fire. I, I don't know exactly <laughs> what's going on. And, but I have an impression that we have a choice between these two different scenarios. Right. One is a decay so, of something. Let me speak to that. So I think these are really two different sides of the same coin, two different ways of think, two complementary ways of thinking about what's happening. And they're both accurate in their own way. And you're, you're actually exactly right that in some sense, the, the fossil fuels are the product of organic systems intentionally binding carbon and hydrogen and oxygen, these hydrocarbons, into configurations that are not their most low energy. It, it's basically an energy storage device that was developed by plants millions of years ago, right? So the fossil fuels are, as you say, it's in some sense, it's something you can burn and get the energy out. But when you're burning it and getting the energy out, you're just releasing energy that was captured a long time ago and stored by a clever mechanism of photosynthesis. I mean, plants evolved for billions of years in order to efficiently capture solar energy, and in doing so, put it into a chemical, biochemical system, which is stored in terms of hydrocarbons. I mean, that's what our, that's what plants do that produce the food that we eat. And then we eat the hydrocarbons, like you eat an apple, it's got those, those molecules in it, that your system breaks down to release that energy. So in some sense, fossil fuels are actually an energy storage mechanism. And they're an energy storage mechanism that were implemented by plants a long time ago. And so I think it's actually very interesting to think about our current energy technologies in that way. And let me just make two comments. One is people talk about hydrogen as the energy of the energy source of the future. Hydrogen is not an energy source. It's actually an energy storage mechanism. If you break water, exactly as you were saying, you take water, you can break it up into oxygen and hydrogen, but that's a less, stable state. It's a higher energy state. And so if you if you burn the hydrogen, the hydrogen combines with oxygen to give you water again. So a fuel cell, a hydrogen fuel cell is a mechanism that takes energy in, separates hydrogen and oxygen, and then you can use the hydrogen as a fuel in your car or your hydrogen vehicle. And it's the second of the two sides of the coin that you were mentioning. That hydrogen is then recombining with the oxygen and releasing energy. Um, similarly, I would in some sense think of fossil fuels as, as I say, energy storage, energy that was captured a long time ago. And that brings us to the interesting question of what is the best way of capturing solar energy? 
Um, and it, you know, plants are very inefficient at capturing um, solar energy. If you look at the, the increase in mass of, sol of uh, plants based on solar energy, um, they have about a 1% efficiency as, comp as compared to um, as compared to engineered photovoltaic systems. But on the other hand, you could imagine organic systems that have a much higher efficiency. I was actually having a fascinating discussion with your colleague, uh, Alison Sweeney earlier, who we, we chatted with, who, who studies these things in, in biological systems. And, you know, there are biological systems that exist that have higher, you know, algaes that can absorb energy in various ways. And, and you know, maybe Alison can tell you more about some of these, but there are interesting ways to imagine that in the coming decades, we may be able to find sort of hybrid biological engineered systems that may have higher photo, photo capture, photo energy capture efficiency than what we've got right now. And this is really taking the second of the two points, Stan, that you took, which is taking a system, either engineered or natural, and thinking of it as something that's separating out um, chemicals that can then be allowed to release the energy. Does that help address your question? Yeah, perfectly, yes. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay, given the time, I think we should thank Wadi again for, uh, for the very nice talk. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Wadi, I believe you have uh, your meeting with, with people after this. Right, I was actually just a behind that. schedule. I think that um, my next meeting was supposed to run from 5 to 5.30 with Steve. Uh, yeah. And I had a meeting with David Poland from 5.30. But uh, maybe uh, yeah. we can do 15 minutes with each if David. If, uh, uh, well, I, I'm, I, uh, that's, let's just move over to, do you have the Zoom link where it is? Uh, yes, I do. So I'll meet. Okay, I'll, meet I'll see you there, there momentarily. Yeah. Okay. So then, David, I'll see you there. If you're on this one still, I'll see you there in a few minutes. Thanks very much again, uh, Walter, and everybody else for having yeah, me. Yeah, no, thank you for uh, agreeing to give this talk. Yeah, it was a wonderful talk. Thank you, Wadi. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Take care, everybody. Nice Wadi, see you soon.